You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Anton Howes of Brown University. Anton, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Nice to be here. Anton studies the history of innovation and invention, specifically looking at innovation in Britain during the Industrial Revolution. So, Anton, start by telling us a little bit about Britain during the period you study. What's the historical context for all these innovations? So it's a really interesting period. So I start in 1547 with the death of Henry VIII. So Britain is in a pretty bad place economically, technologically. Henry VIII wastes quite a lot of money. You're about to have a a big devaluation. You've had a lot of devaluations of the currency, which is about to get even worse in the 1550s. Britain is behind on most most technologies. So the German-speaking lands, the Italian lands, they tend to be the ones that are most advanced at the time. And then fast forward about 300 years to, say, 1851, which is when just the kind of end of the period that I study, Britain is technologically supreme, right? You've got the Great Exhibition built in the Crystal Palace, you know, 300,000 panes of the largest ever panes of glass produced in the largest enclosed space on Earth, and people coming from all around the world just to see the kind of technological marvels that Britain has produced, um, and the rest of the world too, but predominantly it's really to show off that kind of dominance technologically. Um, whereas in 1547, barely anyone could actually make glass in Britain whatsoever, let alone clear glass of the kind that we're used to today. Okay, so... So, I mean, this coincides with the Industrial Revolution, but you're focused on the technology side of things. That's right. So, yeah, it's it's the Industrial Revolution period, but actually a lot of the economic growth really comes later on. I'm not so interested so much in, you know, how much growth there was at any particular time, but rather what were the sources of that growth, which I think are much, much earlier. So, you know, we think of the Industrial Revolution being this kind of classical period, let's say 1760 or 1780 to 1830. That's the sort of first Industrial Revolution, if you like. Um, But actually, a lot of the inventions that were used during that period, they're invented much, much earlier. So the first steam engines you've got being produced in the late 17th century, for example. Okay. And you distinguish between the terms innovation and invention. So before we get into the sort of meat and potatoes of this discussion, uh, do you want to distinguish what, what is the difference in your view between innovation and invention? So for me, innovation is a sort of useful catch-all term for all kinds of improvements. Now, the thing I should distinguish it from is the kind of very popular one amongst economists and economic historians, which is that inventions are these tangible products that you kind of create using scientific knowledge and tweaking, etc. Whereas innovations are those products that are developed specifically for the market. So products and processes that you want to be able to sell. And then you have this additional st- stage, at least according to Schumpeter, which is diffusion. Um, so invention, innovation and diffusion. Now, I think actually most people, when they say innovation, they mean improvement improvements that are both tangible, like inventions, and intangible. So a new technique, for example. So my favorite example of an innovation rather than an invention would be Edward Allenson's introduction of the idea of washing your hands before conducting surgery. You know, this is the sort of thing that most people, I think, would call an innovation, but not necessarily an invention. And it's something that's not necessarily covered by Schumpeter's definition. You know, it's not a a technique that was sold necessarily, although it was useful. Um, It was an improvement. Um, So when I tend to use innovation, I I tend to use it in the same sense, I think, that most people tend to use it, which is this very broad catch-all term for inventions, which are tangible and physical, you know, um, spinning jennies and cotton gins and iPhones and what have you. And then the intangible things as well, new techniques like washing your hands before surgery or new medical techniques, surgical techniques, etc. So in the period you study, uh, there's a rapid acceleration in just the the amount or the you know the the number of these innovations and their usefulness and people have suggested different causes of this uh so some people talk about education and literacy in britain during the period um other people talk about nutrition i i think i've even heard someone suggest that um the fact that they discovered coffee beans in the new world and everyone switched from drinking alcohol with which is a depressant to coffee which is a stimulant might have had some kind of effect on uh production of new ideas and innovations do you want to comment on on the past theories uh on on this period and on innovation in the period so i think when we talk about i mean the coffee one is pretty interesting i i mean i don't know how how much truth there is to it although i think a lot of the inventors did like to hang out around coffee shops so who knows 
But when it comes to skills, there's one thing that needs to be distinguished, I think. I mean, there's two ideas. One of them is that skills are necessary to the actual process of innovation itself. And the other one, which I mean, people like John McKeer talk about quite a lot, which is the idea that Britain wasn't particularly special in Europe in terms of having inventors. But what it was particularly special at was it had a lot of skilled people who were able to adopt and then adapt those inventions. So it's more to do with the take up of innovation rather than necessarily the innovations themselves. So skills, I think, can be very useful as a as a means of um, adopting innovations. But I actually, I mean, m- my research tends to question whether or not it's all that useful when it comes to the innovative process itself. Um, so let me, I, I guess I can explain sort of what I mean by that, which is that a lot of inventors, they go into fields where they don't necessarily know anything about the industry that they're going into. Um, some f- famous examples of this might be um, the Reverend Edmund Cartwright. Um, so he develops one of the earliest power looms, so a fully automated loom. Um, but he was just an Anglican clergyman. He went to university, which might you know show up in people's tables as, as saying, oh, well, you know, highly educated, that'll be very useful. But when you actually look at what he studied at university, it turns out that he really just had a penchant for, you know, the classics and poetry and the arts and that sort of thing. So he's really someone who goes into this thinking, oh, in theory, I can get this done. I can, I can create this innovation. And then as he creates his own models, he experiments with his own and his own little kind of self-education, his own little tweaks. He then hires other people um, to try and make some of those elements really work. And, but he, you know, he complains even about the most skilled mechanics in Manchester who he hires to make this machine. When he visits them after he's you know, left the parts with them for a little while, he comes, he, can, he goes there and, and discovers that they basically haven't start, even started work on it because they think it's completely impossible. And that's not, by the way, even from a biography or an autobiography, it's actually just from his correspondence, his letters. So it's pretty good um, suggestion that that was, that that was true. Yeah, this idea of the, the outsider coming in and, and shaking things up, it kind of reminds me of uh, Thomas Kuhn's idea of the paradigm shift, which, of course, he applied to science and scientific disciplines. But this is sort of a, a case of something very much like that happening in industry. That's right. Although I think we also have to be careful not to put too much stress on the effects of innovations. So the power loom was a very, very effective innovation. But you have other ones where people are coming from, you know, complete outside of that industry and changing things. And very much for the better, but not necessarily in a kind of revolutionary way. Um, You've got some very original inventions coming in that aren't necessarily these huge leaps and bounds forward or or ones that are necessarily going to be disruptive. And that's one of the other um, words that you hear a lot around innovation. I actually think very few innovations are disruptive, which means you've got a lot of people creating um, smaller tweaks, uh, more marginal improvements to existing processes. So let's talk about your approach to studying this. Of course, it's a lot of people have written about, you know, case studies of these inventors. But what the really interesting thing you do is you take those specific cases and turn it into data, right? Uh, So you've compiled a sample of 677 innovators, and I'm guessing they weren't all listed in some convenient database somewhere. So what were you looking for from all these innovators, and how did you go about collecting all that information? So actually, it's it's more than 677 now. That's what I did for my PhD thesis. It's now a whopping 1,453. Wow. So it's, it's, it's quite a large number of innovators now. But yes, you're right. Part of it is from um, taking the older list. So people have done this sort of thing before. They've, they've, they've taken um, big biographical lists and put, to get, put them together for data, um, but they've never been quite that large. So I took all of the existing ones, you know, squished all of them together, took out a few cases where they weren't necessarily actually innovators. So sometimes people turn up in the patent record because they were patent agents, essentially lawyers registering the invention on behalf of a client. Um, Or you'll get people who were just after my cutoff period, you know, ending in 1851, for example. And then part of it's also about trying to correct for some of the biases. So a lot of people, one of the, you know, one of the first questions I usually get is, okay, well, how many of these people were taking out patents? Are you just relying on the patent record? One of the things I did was I tried to find industries that weren't where, where patenting wasn't quite as common and other sources where that shows up. So, for example, what's today called the Royal Society of Arts and was then called the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, etc., 
they, between 1765 and the 1840s, they would offer prizes for inventions that weren't patented, at least in theory. So that's a pretty good source of, so a history of, of the RSA is a pretty good source of more inventor names to add to the list to correct for that bias. A few other ones are things like, for example, most of these older lists, they tend to have one or two women. Um, so one of the things I did, I used Autumn Stanley's Mothers and Daughters of Invention, just went through and found all of the names trying to supplement the number. I mean, it still only comes to about 1% of the total, and there are various reasons for that. But it's still, I think, a slightly, there's slightly more balance to the sample than there was before, and hopefully captures a bit of what was going on in general. I mean, the real aim is to try and find out, you know, why were people doing this? What do they all have in common? What is it that gets gentlemen to invent at the same time as craftsmen, at the same time as farmers, at the same time as, you know, why is it women and men? Why is it um, this kind of almost universal activity that anyone seems to be able to do from any social background um, and with any skill? Like, that's the really surprising thing is that you've got these amateurs as well as these skilled professionals doing it. Yeah. Uh, one thing that really interested me when I was reading uh, some of your work uh, is that you note that many of these inventors knew each other and that they tended to inspire innovation in the people they met. Uh, so you had a very interesting blog post on Medium uh, where you argue that a man named John D might have been responsible for sort of introducing this mindset to the British Isles. Uh, we'll link to that post at economicsdetective.com slash innovation. So Anton, tell me about John D. Who was he and uh, why does he occupy this important place? So John D is an interesting one. I'm not certain that he's the person that introduces this improving mentality, if you like, this kind of influence to Britain. But he's certainly the earliest one on the list. And it's also kind of neat, I think, for a symbolic date. Um, what happens is that he visits um, the Low Countries. He goes to Leuven, where he hangs out with Gerardus Mercator uh, and Gemma Frisius and a whole bunch of other instrument makers in um, kind of the, the Low Countries. You know, so they're, they're all speaking Flemish, um, but actually they're all speaking Latin because that's the sort of lingua franca of the Republic of Letters. Um, but he visits in 1547, the same date as Henry VIII dies. And it's a kind of a neat date there. And what he does is he hangs out with them and he brings back a lot of the instruments that they were working with. So the, really the cutting edge of technology. Um, but the reason I think that he's a key player and not just is, is not just because he's one of the earliest, but because a lot of the other earlier inventors in the list, they seem to have known him. So, for example, he was the foster parent to Thomas Diggs. Um, he was great friends with Leonard Diggs, who was another instrument maker, um, the inventor of the theodolite, as far as we can tell, which is a sort of surveying instrument. Um, he's friends with, I mean, a lot of these earlier um, inventors who are doing all sorts of different things. So they're not just improving instruments, the sort of things that he brings back, but they're improving, you know, um, Hugh Platt, for example, who visits him, meets him via his father-in-law. He uh, invents perfumes and weapons and armor and um, also a really wide range of inventions. And that's the other really interesting thing is that the majority of inventors, 55% or so, 56, 55, 56%, they seem to have been polymathic, right? They were inventing in multiple industries. They weren't just mm -hmm. con con consigning themselves to a single industry. Um, you do get people like that. Um, but what's interesting is just how many of them seem to really kind of spread their inventive hobby, if you like, a bit further than that into the areas where they were more unfamiliar. Yeah, I really like this idea of uh, the inventor's mindset as, as sort of a contagion, you know, spreading across continental Europe and then to the low countries and then catching in, in Britain and spreading like a plague, but a good plague. It's, it's interesting that you can sort of trace these relationships between uh, people even who, who live so long ago. I guess um, it's recent enough that we have some fairly good records. So your work seems to be complementary with uh, Deirdre McCluskey's idea of bourgeois dignity as a driver of uh, progress in the Industrial Revolution. Do you see this sort of innovative mindset as related to the bourgeois virtues that McCluskey talks about? I mean, there's potentially some kind of relationship. I mean, she was a very key influence on me getting started at this project. Mm. Um, so really, I mean, part of what motivated me in the, in the first place was to try and test some of her theories, try to work out, OK, to what extent does, the, does her thesis apply to the inventors themselves, those men and women who are kind of at the cold face, if you like. Um, I think there is potentially some kind of complementarity there. You certainly see an increase in the number of middle class inventors, so people from middle class backgrounds, and a decrease in those from gentlemanly backgrounds. 
having said that, gentlemen were never really at any point, you know, a, a major source of inventors. You still, you always kind of throughout had this had, had these middle class people. So I'm not sure exactly how we would complement it, but I think there's definitely some kind of overlap. They're certainly not mutually exclusive. I think it could be both things at the same time. You've got this spread, and you've also got this lifting of constraints that she that she stresses. In terms of sources of the industrial revolution, though, I mean, it being the spread of a plague, a good plague, as as, as you said. That's, I think, only kind of one part of the story. Um, it doesn't necessarily answer why Britain, as I pointed out, you know, it spreads from the low countries, it seems, mm -hmm. and from Italy as well. There are some other inventors like that. I think there's something else going on that makes Britain special. Um, and I suspect the, the, the biggest, for, for me, I think the most likely thing is that in Britain, especially so um, relative to other European countries, you see this tendency for innovators to spread innovation further, to actively try and diffuse that idea. Um, so a lot of them engage in teaching, in public lecturing. A lot of them publish their inventions. Um, some of them do selectively, so they'll keep you know, the most crucial secret part of their machine as secret as possible. But at the same time, they'll try and spread as much as possible around it so that people could then tweak it and improve it. Secrecy, it turns out, is actually relatively rare. I mean, of overt secrecy, you know, hiding things away, locking, locking things away, trying to make sure that no one discovers you. And that, I mean, in the old sample of 675 innovators, I found that, you know, it was the overwhelming majority, 80 something percent, had some kind of pro sharing activity. Now, the thing is, until I compare it to other inventors in other countries, I can't actually say this for sure, but it's what I strongly suspect. You know, I was really shocked at just how many seem to have this pro sharing activity. Hmm. So, so it's partly that uh, these inventors were operating in a community uh, i guess it'd be interesting to see if uh if previous inventors or inventors in other countries tended to be more um closed or more more independent i guess in just inventing on their own and uh not necessarily you know working together in groups or or um publicly publishing things i know isaac newton invented calculus and then sort of sat on it for a decade until uh until gottfried leibniz uh you know, also invented it independently. And then, you know, and so, so that might be an example of someone who had some really useful invent inventions and didn't necessarily um, spread them around or innovations that he didn't necessarily spread around right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, Newton was just a bit of a recluse at the beginning mm -hmm. of his career and he really didn't take criticism well. So he didn't like people reading and then commenting on his work, at least at first. But he does go on to be, you know, president of the Royal Society. He does have a very major role in, in spreading innovation, at least later on, maybe not when he was a young man. But I mean, I think what you do see is, so anecdotally, I would say that early Britain in the 16th and very early 17th century is quite closed off relative to what happens later on. Um, it's one of the reasons that I, I pushed the sample all the way back to 1547. Initially, it stopped in 1651, which is the end of the English Civil War. And but I pushed it back to 1547 just to really try and capture what was going on in the very early years and why there's this then later acceleration. I mean, the biggest acceleration seems to occur in the early 18th century, not the late 18th century, as you know, the classic Industrial Revolution period would, would seem to suggest. Um, although it obviously keeps going up and up from there. Um, and what you find is a lot of these inventors, they'll, you know, they'll publish a description of their invention and then it'll have a little footnote or a little appendix just saying, and by the way, if you'd like to figure out how this thing worked, you can give me a bit of money for it. So you have this sort of, it, the, their publications are really more like advertisements um, rather than necessarily telling you what they can do, but not telling you how they work. And I think that's the big shift that occurs. In the 18th century, they start telling you how exactly those things work. Now, some people are still obviously more secretive than others, um, but I think you, you get some very, especially very successful people who are pushing that. Um, Josiah Wedgwood, the pottery pioneer, for example, in Burslem, Staffordshire, his patent records is the patent specifications are highly detailed. So he'll, you'll be able to go in the patent, um, patent record and you'll be able to work out what exactly, how exactly this thing worked. Other potters, on the other hand, will be a lot more kind of uh, secretive about it. They'll, they'll use very vague terms. They'll put in certain words that don't quite work um, when you try to replicate it. So what, what other trends do you notice over time? So there's an acceleration, I assume, meaning that there's just more innovations and more innovators as you as you go through this time period do you notice things like uh changes in the qualitative changes uh in in the way people innovate or or in you know the connections between innovators uh 
changing over time? Yeah, so you certainly, so you see this, what I mean by acceleration is you see an uptick in the number of new inventors every decade, mm. uh, which then obviously leads to an even more pronounced uptick in the total number of inventors just around at any one time, right? So you sort of see growth of inventors, which then leads to a higher total of inventors um, because the, the growth starts to outpace the rate at which they die. Mm. Um, so there's that. And then you've also got... In terms of qualitative changes, it's not, I mean, you've, you've certainly got new industries being, being created, photography, electricity, especially electric um, telegraphy. Iron starts to really come in and affect shipbuilding and weaponry and the like. So you, you do see people going into that. One of the really big changes is that in terms of their skill backgrounds, um, you really see a huge movement into um, people being trained as mechanics or as millwrights or, you know, what we'd now call mechanics or engineers. Um, those sorts of engineering backgrounds, you know, in the first, uh, so up to, so from 1547 to 1750, just off the top of my head, I think it's something like 7% of the inventors in that period seem to have engineering backgrounds. And yet in the early 18th, uh, sorry, early 19th century, so from 1801 to 1851, it's 37%. So you mm -hmm. see a really huge rise, like the first 200 years, nothing's, that, that there's not so much of that. And then in, in this very short space of time, when you have the most inventors, they're having that kind of background. And part of that, I think, is because the profession starts to organize itself and because there are more routes into um, those areas. And part of it's also that you get these hubs of mechanics. You've got people like you know, James Watt and Matthew Bolton are the most famous examples, and probably rightly so in terms of their impact, because a lot of the people they took on as apprentices then go on to be um, very important um, innovators in their own right, um, and often in completely different fields. So a lot of the gas engineering, for example, so gas for lighting and for heating, um, a lot of that comes out of the Bolton and Watt factory at Soho in Birmingham, not because they were necessarily doing stuff with it, but because they had other engineers other employees working there who were tink tinkering around with that sort of thing yeah so the the rise of sort of the the professional engineer uh may have contributed to to some of the innovation in the later period so you have a recent article where you discuss the distinction between macro inventions and micro inventions which are terms coined by joel mokir in the early 90s could you discuss those terms and what they mean yeah, so you'll notice that I haven't used them up to now, um, partly mm -hmm. because I, I've tried to move away from using them to a certain extent. So what, how it started out was that in The Lever of Riches in 1990, Makir, I think, coins the term. I mean, it's certainly one of the earliest uses I've seen by him. So he coins the term, and the way he defines a macro invention is as an invention that was very novel, very original. So it's to do with the actual process of invention, something that's a kind of out of the blue, you know, like a steam engine out of nowhere. It's like, bam, you know, this wasn't here before. Suddenly it's, it's, it's there. Or a kind of combinative type of macro invention. So people noticing two different industries and combining them in a completely original way that no one had really noticed. And the key point about that is that that sort of process isn't, isn't easily explained by economic incentives. You can't just have a demand for something that just wasn't there, right? It's a sort of random process. It's very unpredictable. You can't work out when those sorts of things are going to happen. Um, and micro inventions were then the sort of follow ups to those. So you start off with very inefficient steam engines that are pulling a bit of water out of a mine. Um, and people, they tweak those, they add little valves, they, they make them safer and more efficient. Um, you have a lot of micro inventions, these sort of smaller tweaks to the initial big bang inventions, if you like, but then improve upon it. The problem is that over time, um, and actually, interestingly, even McKeer himself has, has started adopting what, what I think is a completely different definition of macro invention, micro invention. So macro invention has become more about the size of the invention's effects rather than a comment about its sources. So the classic macro invention for 1990 McKeer was the hot air balloon. In fact, he calls it the classic invention over and over again. You know, it's something that's you know completely radical, almost out of nowhere, can't be predicted by economic incentives. Um, whereas a macro invention for, I guess, 2011 and later McKeer, and again, I, I don't think this change occurs because of him. I think it's other people adopting it and then using it in this way. Um, macro invention is, would be something like, you know, the steam engine is, is a classic one because of its impact rather than because of its um, originality. Um, so I think there's a difference to be made between something that's radically new 
and something that is just that's radical in terms of its disruption right and, um, that it causes to other industries and uh you you talk about how there's a distinction between you know the causes of the invention and its effects and you you point out that uh uh, somebody made a water-based telegraph that was very original, but had almost no effect on on yeah. you know further development. So for 1990 Makir, that would have been a macro invention. But nowadays, I think most people would would not call that a macro invention. Uh, I don't think they would they it would it wouldn't fit into any of the schemas actually because um, it's not a small and marginal improvement on something, but it's it didn't have a big impact either. Um, I think the danger with using a term that talks about the effects. Um, rather than the causes, is that you start to get a kind of bias towards just counting the important inventors. Um, I'm using air quotes there, the important air quotes inventors. And that's one of the things I've tried to get away from in, in having such a large sample of innovators in, in my own work, um, which is that I'm not interested in why certain ones were more successful than others. I'm not interested in why certain of them were more famous than others. I'm interested in why, you know, everyone from the uh, the cook's boy who creates air balloons, the hot air balloons, to the uh, gentleman who creates carriages, um, why they're inventing, even if those inventions have a very marginal effect. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, just one more note on this macro versus micro. Uh, the The way I sort of started thinking about it was, you know, when you're solving these, when you're trying to solve like a complex optimization problem, which technology arguably is, you you can get stuck at a, a what's called a local maximum, right? You're very well optimized for, you know, within the narrow range of things that you're doing. But then, you know, if you could just radically shift out of that range, get onto a whole different uh, tack and, and then you could... Uh, then maybe your your optimum is is much higher, much better. So, um, you know the difference between uh, you know breeding better, faster horses and creating a you know a steam engine or an automobile. And so, sometimes the early um, versions of the new technology are, are not not as good as the the well optimized version of the old technology. So, um, early firearms were much less effective than uh, than you know the longbow. Uh, but of course, nobody uses a longbow anymore. Um, right. So um, you you've having dug through over a thousand in, inventors now. Um, you must have some favorites among them. Some some good sort of illustrative stories. Do you do you mind uh, telling a bit about some specific inventors that uh, you think are particularly interesting? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Where to where to start? I know. Um, right? I do have a few favorites. Okay. So. All-time favorite has got to be um, Benjamin Thompson, Camp Rumford. So interestingly, he was born in America, in the American colonies. Um, and also interestingly, Rumford is a town, I think, in Virginia. And it's certainly in, 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 in America. Um, and he might be, I'm, I'm pretty sure, he might be um, the only person to have held an aristocratic title that referred to a place in the independent United States. Because obviously the Constitution banned all of all of the titles of nobility. Huh. So for him to be a count of Rumford, which is a you know a town in Virginia where he had taught, um, was very unusual. Now I'm not saying that America accepted that, um, although they did try to hire him at, at one point after he was already count Rumford. Um, but the reason for that is because um, so he fought for the loyalist side in the in the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Um, he then goes back to Britain, or goes to Britain, and he kind of gallivants all around Europe acting as a sort of technical consultant to all sorts of different people, and in particular falls in with the prince-elector of Bavaria. Um, and the prince-elector very briefly becomes the vice-regent of the Holy Roman Empire, and so awards him this county, um, so his title as a count of the Holy Roman Empire. Huh. Um, and then I guess, suppose he was asked, oh, where do you want to be count of? And he said, Rumford. So they, would say, they said, okay. <laughs> But interestingly, at one, so at one point he was you know, minister of basically everything um, in Bavaria. Um, he almost single-handedly saved Munich from destruction by by French and Austrian armies, which were kind of converging on it. And the prince elector had gone off to retreat to one of his his country palaces. Um, Rumford was returning from Britain, having just been rejected by George III because he tried to be an ambas ambassador um, to the British court from Bavaria. And George III said, "Absolutely not. You're actually British." subject so there's no way you could be an ambassador of a foreign power 
And so he's on his way back and he um, comes across the army in the middle, in, in the court between the Austrian and the French armies and more or less takes charge um, and negotiates that both of those armies would avoid Munich and, and avoid the destruction that would come with it. Um, but he, I mean, he, I don't really know where to start with him. He does so much. Um, he's most famous, I think, for essentially developing convection ovens. He sets up the Rumford Prize, which is one of the highest prizes you can still get from the Royal Society. Um, he sets up the Royal Institution um, in, in Britain. Um, at one point, and this is one of my favourite stories, so he, he marries um, the French chemist Lavoisier's widow. Um, and it is it is a very short lived marriage, I have to say, because she was she liked being the she was she was considered more or less the sort of the last person to be holding one of these really lavish 18th century salons, um, really liked to chat with all of these people and exchange ideas, etc. And I think by that stage, she was a bit younger, I think, than, than Rumford at that stage. Age. Rumford was getting into his older age and getting a bit grumpy. Um, and so he instructed his, his doorman to lock out all of her guests. And so she was forced to conduct the salon over the garden fence. And so in retribution, she pours boiling water all, over all of the flowers that he had been cultivating. So you get these great stories of him. I mean, he, he his first wife he actually leaves behind in America, so it's only after she dies that he that he remarries. Um, but we get, we get all these snippets from his correspondence with his daughter. Um, so he's 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 one of my favourites. Another favourite would be uh, Thomas Dover. So Thomas Dover was active in the very early 18th century. Um, he was a protege of Thomas Sydenham, um, who's a very influential um, doctor, uh, medical pioneer. He's really the person I think to pioneer the use of the Baconian program, um, kind of gradual development of medicine. Um, so Thomas Dover is one of his uh, proteges. But Thomas Dover also becomes a privateer, so essentially a pirate, um, and is not just a doctor on a, on a, on a privateer ship he actually captains presumably because he paid a lot of money for it um, using the proceeds of his medical practice he captains one of the ships i forget the pirate captain's name oh woods rogers he's under woods rogers and he's the captain of the ship that discovers alexander selkirk who was the real life robinson crusoe oh okay but his invention dover's powder was actually used up and well well into the 20th century as a sort of purgative um, powder. I think the reason you won't he have heard of it today is because one of the active ingredients was opium. Um, mm. So today in most countries it'd be illegal. But he he was also known at the time as Dr. Quicksilver because he really liked using mercury to treat people's ailments. Which of course um, so will a poison bit of an innovator, you. <laughs> and obviously he, there's the poisonous element of that as well. Although I should say, I should say that when we look back at those sorts of medicines, we think, oh, how, how ridiculous and how awful. Why would they use a poison like that? Well, the reason people use Quicksilver was because was, was to usually to treat syphilis. So essentially the I guess the sixteenth and seventeenth century AIDS equivalent. You know, people were having this huge scare about syphilis. Um, and mercury functions a bit like um, chemo. Um, it kills off everything, including, you know, you. So you need to try and, 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 and limit how much you're taking, but it operates on a pretty similar principle. The idea is you can kill off syphilis um, and hope that you don't die in the process as well. Okay, so there, there was some medical. Yeah, there was, there was often actually a reason for using these things. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, this is a totally different period, but uh, a lot of uh, Chinese emperors uh, ended up killing themselves trying to make immortality potions, and one mm -hmm. of the common ingredients was mercury. But I mean, I guess I guess there are some circumstances where a little mercury might be better than nothing. Yeah. So ah, uh, that's fascinating. Uh, an inventor pirate. Oh, there's actually a few inventor pirates, <laughs> especially all of the early, uh, so the, the late 16th century ones. A lot of John Dee's friends um, are privateers because privateering was quite common back then. Mm. Especially, you know, England, as I, as I mentioned, England is very technologically behind. I mean, you can kind of think of England in the late 16th century as a sort of a bit like Somalia today. I mean, it's, it's behind, it's quite poor. There's a lot of piracy. It's one of the main ways that people make a lot of their money. I mean, there obviously are some big differences as well um, because England was, you know, it wasn't quite a great power at that stage, but it was quite an important uh, player in Europe at that time. But yeah, you've got a lot of people going off and being adventurers, you know, raiding French and Spanish treasure, treasure ships, etc. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a fascinating period to be sure. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, so I get, I guess, uh, with all these, you know, connections between the inventors, you could almost have sort of a, a family tree of, uh, of, of British invention with, with the, uh, what the, the Count of Rumford guy, he, he traveled all over. Is, is that common? Were these inventors particularly well-traveled? 
It's mixed. So I would say a lot of them do stay put. Certainly the, the richer ones will, will travel a bit. A lot of the gentlemen, as part of their education, they would go on a grand tour. Um, there's one whose name I can't recall, but there's one who was even paid by his relatives not to go to university and to go on a grand tour instead. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. Presumably it was because they thought that he would become too bookish um, by going to university. But uh, it certainly wasn't considered a, an essential part of, the, of their education. So going on a grand tour, going, you know, especially to Italy, perhaps later, I mean, in the later period on to Greece, to look at all of the ruins and kind of soak in um, the Roman architecture and then the Greek architecture. That was a, considered a key part of their of, gen, of gentlemanly education. So you've got a lot of those. Um, I think they, they tend to be the ones that go abroad the most often, especially in the, and then in the early 19th century, you've got a lot of the richer ones. They start creating markets beyond just England and they start selling to France and America and other countries as well. Robert Whitehead, I think one of the inventors of the torpedo, um, he has a lot of dealings in Austria. Austria, for example, um, or at least in what I guess would today be Croatia and, and northeastern Italy. Okay, yeah, you sort of. This is the period when uh, when the world is getting more globalized and and yeah. trade and transportation are are getting cheaper and more available to people. So you'd expect some of the uh, so to, there to be some kind some interaction with the broader world, uh, even even if the sort of epicenter of uh, invention was Great Britain. You, you've mentioned uh, education a few times in this conversation, um, but the the universities back then wouldn't have been like uh, would not have been too similar to our universities today. Uh, a lot of people learning classics, uh, and could could you talk about a little a bit about how education worked and how how related or unrelated it was to to innovation? So, I mean, education for a lot of inventors seems to start, and maybe in general as well, but I mean, I don't really know the inventors that well, but for a lot of inventors it seems to start with, you've got some kind of village schooling, you've got some kind of local schooling. Um, and that tends to just be your, a your ABCs, your very basic arithmetic, maybe some bit of multiplication. So those will be the three things that they'll, I mean, usually when you look at their own accounts of their schooling, they say, oh, I was just beaten up all the time by the teacher, you know, being smacked with a ruler or whatever for not being able to learn Latin properly. In some cases, especially in dissenting circles, so dissenters were, you know, non-Anglicans, people who couldn't be in the offices in the military or they couldn't be in Parliament. You know, these are um, Unitarians, Presbyterians, Baptists, Quakers, um, a, a whole bunch of different sects like that. Those are the, and the Catholics even. Um, Although they're not usually considered dissenters, but they weren't they weren't Anglicans. So these nonconformists, um, their education sometimes also includes an element of science. So a lot of people like like um, Joseph Priestley, um, Richard Price, inventors in their own right, um, they they come through this system where the schooling and then kind of later academies, um, because they were they were they couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, um, they tend to get this sort of more scientific education. Now the other thing that goes on is in terms of the universities, um, the Scottish universities and the universities in the Low Countries in particular are open to everyone. Oxford and Cambridge are restricted just to Anglicans um, for most of the period up until I think 1829, which is when you get Catholic emancipation. And yet, and I should say that this doesn't. Really, I suppose it doesn't really apply to everything that comes before um, 1660, when you've got this constant religious upheaval and one, you know, one king's doing this, one queen's doing that, and the religion's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, but once things really settle down in the in the in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the system you get is that you've got these Scottish universities which are open to, to everyone, especially nonconformists, and then you've got Oxford and Cambridge, and the, the universities that are most popular are the Scottish ones, um, particularly Edinburgh. Edinburgh really comes to dominate the number of, in, in terms of its influence, the number of inventors amongst those who are university educated. Um, it really is quite a lot of them. Now, it's still only 92 inventors in the list go to, go to um, Edinburgh, but it's far higher than, than any of the other universities in terms of their impact. Um, in context, only about 18% of inventors in the list go to university at all. Um, but it's much higher when you include all sorts of other places. So another form of education was um, you got a lot of math and surveying and trigonometry and geometry if you're educated at the Royal Military Academy um, at Woolwich, although there's a later one at uh, Sandhurst as well. What's interesting about Woolwich is you've got a whole bunch of inventors 
working there, people, people like Peter Barlow, um, Charles Hutton in particular, um, Thomas Simpson, um, William Sturgeon, they're all in, the, in, in, in and around Woolwich, some of them teaching officially at the university, other, others of them kind of being nearby but on hand um, and helping some of these inventors out. And that's the sort of place that um, trains people like uh, Henry Shrapnel, inventor of the shrapnel um, shell. Um, mm. You know, he he's one of the people that's that's educated there, and it's interesting that you get those those sorts of influences. A lot of British engineers who go to Canada as well, and then come back, and and, and they they do a bit of in inventing around uh, Newfoundland. Okay, interesting. They tend to have been trained at the Royal Military Academy. In fact, I think Henry Shrapnel's correspondence for a thing is in Canada. And of course, uh, being uh, in economics, I. Uh... I always think of Adam Smith coming out of the. Uh, uh, was was he out of Edinburgh? Uh, I, he was at least out of Scotland. Um, yeah, now you now you got me thinking. He taught <laughs> at Glasgow, I want to say, mm. but maybe he was educated in Edinburgh. He's certainly in those circles. So you've got the Select Society, for example. Um, Henry Home, Lord Kames, who's a, a law lord, um, a judge. He uh, he is a great agricultural improver, especially later on in life, essentially after he retires. Actually, fun story about him. His parting words to his uh, fellow judges um, when he retired was, Fair ye a wheel, ye bitches. So <laughs> he was a bit of a character. Hmm. So do you have any closing thoughts, anything we haven't discussed in the course of this conversation? Um, nothing springing completely to mind. You'd have to, I think, prompt me um, for, <laughs> for where to go on, because I can just carry on forever um, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of inventor stories. Um, I guess I could add a, just an, an, an extra one um, in terms of favorites, which would be um, Blind Jack of, of Nairsborough, um, real name John Metcalf, who lived to an extraordinary age. And he was well into his 90s when he died um, and was responsible for all sorts of uh, um, a, a lot of the roads, particularly in the north of England. And astonishingly, he was blind. Um, so he was doing he was surveying and setting out roads because he but must have had this uh, amazing kind of geospatial kind of sense, like a sense of where he was and what directions were which, um, because he could apparently do pretty much anything but completely blind. I mean, he, he was blinded by smallpox when he was age six. I guess my closing thought would just be that a lot of these inventors are doing, did things that we kind of take for granted today. We think, oh, that's something that would have been obvious, um, but actually were quite significant um, improvements to people's um, standard of living and their way of life. And, and you know, we, we use them all the time. And we should, I think it's, it's valuable to learn about steam engines and um, all of the cotton machinery because they had this big impact, particularly on um, economic growth. But it's also worth, you know, learning about the ones who, who, who had this kind of slightly less obvious impact, but one that we and one that we won't necessarily notice, but without which we, you know, in some cases wouldn't even be alive today. You know, I think I'll add just one additional question. Um, does your research have any uh, implications, you think, for maybe the, the inspiring, the aspiring inventors of today? That's a really good question. I think I think the improving mentality has continued to spread, and I think it's more common than ever. I think more people than ever before have are, are, are innovating today, um, and that's one of the reasons I, I've found I've, I haven't even considered yet trying to measure innovators after 1851 because the numbers just get so ridiculous and so large. Mm. I think you know today we're going to be talking tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people the world over, maybe even more than that, um, who are innovating in their own small way. Um, I think the thing to note in terms of you know how to encourage innovation is that you know, sending innovators to talk to people, encouraging this sharing mentality um, is probably the most worthwhile thing you can do. Like you see it in some corners, you've got the open source movement, um, you've got people who give lectures at schools or at universities or who just try to um, encourage people in that way. And I think I think that should be encouraged. That, that should be an activity that's rewarded um, because I think that's one of the most important things you can do. During my thesis defense, one of, one of the questions was, Okay, so should we, you know, send Peter Thiel to uh, Sierra Leone or to Mali or some other country where, you know, growth is a bit behind, or, or the economic output isn't isn't is, is nowhere close to that of um, the United States or Britain or Europe? And you know, I said yes. I think one of the things you could do is just send innovators to those places and see what happens, because they'll be they'll continue innovating themselves there. They'll they'll find ways to improve the lives of those around them in those locations, and hopefully you'll start to see them inspiring those around them to have a go at it as well. 
My guest today has been Anton Howes. Anton, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you. You can head on over to economicsdetective.com slash innovation to learn more about this subject and find a transcript as well as links to all the articles we mentioned. If you want to support the show, uh, you can head on over to economicsdetective.com slash support where you'll find a link to my Patreon page. Patreon is a service that allows you to make small recurring donations to content creators. So, for instance, you could pledge to give $1 per episode, and then that would create an incentive for me to make more episodes. The latest person to pledge to make a donation, recurring donation, is Joao. So thanks, Joao. And if you want to be like Joao and help support the show so I can cover my costs and all that, head to economicsdetective.com slash support. By the way, I think around this time... Uh, Right now, I'm at 98,000 downloads, so by the time this is released, I'll have crossed the 100,000 download mark. So a special thanks to everyone who has shared the show. I couldn't do it without people sharing and word of mouth. That's really my only marketing strategy, and it's worked out pretty well. So thank you for sharing, and if you'd like to do me an extra special favor, uh, share this episode. That would be great. So thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week.